Church, this morning, take your Bible in hand, if you would, and open it to the book of Isaiah, the ninth chapter, a passage that's often used at Christmas on greeting cards and banners and all sorts of ways. It's amazing how God used Isaiah to prophesy so much of not only the coming, but the life and even the death of Christ. Read Isaiah 53, you would just know He's standing at the foot of the cross looking at it and writing of it as a current event, even though it was some 900 years before. But this morning as we think about uh, Christ coming, we want to use uh, the passage of Isaiah to kind of guide our thoughts for a few minutes this morning. If you have with me, stand with me, would you, as we read it together. I'm going to read it out loud. You read along if you would. Huh? Chapter 9, verse 6 is where we're going to begin. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Pray with me. Father, today as we humble ourselves again at the thought, as Bruce said, of the condescension, of the humility, of Christ stepping from that place where He had been in eternity past an object of worship, to step into the creation He created into the virgin's womb and to be born and to live among us, where He was not an object of worship, but in many cases an object of scorn and ridicule, even to the point of His crucifixion. Father, this morning we ask Your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Help us see and understand all that You've provided, the fullness of the gifts You've given, the far-reaching effect it is to our life every single day, that we might be built up and strengthened and blessed, that if there's one that doesn't know You as Savior and Lord, that they may realize today the power and the fullness of the gift You've offered. Lord, accomplish Your great purpose in us and through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and be seated. It's easy to read through Isaiah and miss the play on the words when he says, a child is born and a son is given. Uh, in that one statement, Isaiah focuses on both natures of Christ, that He was and is the Son of Man, and that He is the Son of God. The idea we're going to look at it just a little bit more in a moment, that Christ was able to come as one of us, the glory and the majesty of God in creation, when He created Adam and Eve and he, for the human race, that He created us in such a way that Christ would come and be uh, born among us and live among us and die for us is all there in Isaiah's statement. It points both to the babe of Bethlehem, but also to the Ancient of Days. There's never been a time when Christ was not. Many times uh, in John 1, or when we think about the birth of Christ, many people think of the beginning of Christ, like nine months before June the 13th. I had a beginning. I've, I've not always been. But when from the moment of conception in my mother's womb, there will never be a time anymore when Tony is not. The only question is, where will I be in eternity? Will I be in eternity with God in heaven, or will I be eternity separated from God in hell? But from our moment of conception, there's never been a time, there will never be a time when we're not anymore. But Christ didn't begin at conception with Mary. Christ predates that. He is preexistent Christ, but He stepped in to His creation with Mary and He took on a human body. His earthly body began at conception, but certainly not Him and His identity and His person. When you think about that babe in Bethlehem, uh, it's a picture of weakness. It epitomizes weakness, but then... When we think about a son is given, it points us to the omnipotence of God and all that He is and who that He is. The statement in restrictive to His first coming, it leaps across the ages and goes from the manger all the way to His eternal throne as He ends with that statement of His peace and government, there'll be no end. So this morning I want us to think about it, just a, a two or three things. First of all, the coming of the King in our, the first part of our text, He says... For unto us a child is born, unto us a son 
is given and the government will be upon his shoulder. As I think about that, we think about the praise for the manger. When it says that a child is born, uh, the significance of that is understood in that by one man came sin and by sin came death. People talk about, well, wait a minute, the Genesis account says that Eve sinned first, but the Bible clarifies that. In, Eve saved by deception. She was deceived. Adam sinned knowingly. He understood what he was doing and chose to do it. That's why the Bible says by one man came sin and by sin came death. Well, when the angel appears and he says to Mary, you shall have a son. That's not insignificant. The gender matters because uh, by one man sin came, therefore a man had to come and die. It's pictured in the Old Testament story when the Israelites complained and the serpents were sent as God's judgment and they were being bitten and they go to Moses and God, Moses gives them the instruction from God, take a serpent which is causing the problem and put it on a pole and lift it up and all who look upon the serpent shall live. I can't even tell that story without getting tickled about it. I can't imagine being bit by a serpent going to Moses. Moses, I've been bit. What should I do? Just look upon that serpent and live. I don't want to say, okay, what's plan B? <laughs> I want to say, your mama, there's got to be something else. I, I, you know, look on a serpent, bit me. Look on a serpent. But the theology, God was even preparing and getting right then. A serpent caused the death and a serpent was raised up on a pole. If you'll read John 3, I know we go to verse 16, but it's in that verse. Jesus says, like Moses lifted a serpent up on the pole, if I be lifted up, I'll draw men unto me. Jesus was born a son given. For by one man came sin and by sin came death. But also that He was a son that was given, the very Son of God. Over the years, down through the centuries, theologians have struggled. How do you communicate? How do you uh, articulate that philosophy or that, that, that picture, that theological combination of the mystery of fully man as though he were not God, fully God as though he were not man. His manhood did not impede his godhood. His godhood did not lessen his manhood. But there in perfect unison and perfect union, he was fully God and fully man. And that's exactly the truth. A son is given. John says it simply, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I can't get over, uh, Bruce mentioned it, it's been on my mind, that the, 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 the humiliation, Christ humbled Himself, Paul writes of the church of Philippi. Uh, Philippi. But uh, the word uh, humble Himself seems to be so nice. The word condescended. He was willing to step out of and to step into his own. When it says that um, he dwelt among us, it is that word you've heard it said. It means that he tabernacled, he pitched his tent. He wasn't, he wasn't uh, uh, somehow among us but not like us. I, I remember early in my Christian life thinking, well, since he was the Son of God, maybe the nails didn't hurt. Maybe, maybe uh, you know, it, 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 didn't, it wasn't like that. But that couldn't be any farther from the truth. He was every way flesh like you and I are. If it would hurt me, it hurt him. He tabernacled. He became one of us. The writer of Hebrews was talking about how like us he was. And he says, we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with us. He was tempted in every manner, even as we are, yet without sin. You're not going to face anything in the living these days that Christ did not face. Hardships, hurts, pain, sorrows, tired, hungry. All of that. And yet, He did that for the very purpose because He was one of us. When in our modern day people want to play down humanity and elevate a creation, uh, it's not a new thing. We've, we think we're all hip and new when uh, somebody wants to make ecology God and worship the trees or worship the atmosphere or whether it's animals and we want to elevate animals to human status and all of that kind of stuff. That's not new. That's been going on uh, since after the garden. But God did something in humankind that can never be misunderstood or should never be misunderstood. When He breathed into man's nostril and He became a living soul, God imparted to the human race that which was not imparted to any other part of creation. 
And He did that so that Christ could come. When we hear of the angelic host created by God in heaven for the purpose of worship, that even there, because they were worshipers, their, their worship was tested and Satan revolted and many of the angels were cast out. They weren't created in a way that Christ could come and die on an angelic cross and redeem the angelic host back to Him. They weren't created that way, but mankind was because a child was born, but a son was given that He could become one of us, that He might redeem us from our sin like no other. I really believe that's why when we read through Scriptures, the only people that are ever singing are redeemed people. A redemption song is ours. Nobody else gets to sing it. The angels can say it, but we have the the melody of redemption through Christ Jesus, and we get to sing His praise and rejoice in it. Now we're told, I love the picture Peter gives us of the angelic host, how they are so enamored by what we experience and don't even, we hardly even think about. We give almost no thought to it all. That we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. They are in God's presence, but we are indwelt. They, they, they know nothing of that. And they, they can only imagine what it would be like. And Peter says that they, they strain to look into to understand that. He even says that the angel, Paul writes into the church of Corinth, hey, when you come to church, behave because of the angelic host, that when we gather to worship, that there is an angelic uh, interest in that. What, a, what will a redeemed people say? How will a redeemed people act? What, 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 if we sing out of love for God as our Creator, what must they be going to do? When, when they who are indwelled by the Spirit of God, when they are uh, uh, given opportunity to praise, what must it going to be like? And I wonder how many Sundays they scratch their head and say, well, you know, that seemed a little underplayed. That, 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 I would have expected a little more out of them than that. A child is born, a son is given. He dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. Glory. The glory of God. Time and again, Jesus would say to the skeptic, rogue Pharisees, if you won't accept My words, accept My works. Let the works... How can you deny? Even the man who was born blind said, nobody in the history of the world has ever heard of a person born blind receiving their sight. The Old Testament prophet said when Messiah comes, these are the things He'll do that nobody has ever done and nobody ever will be able to do. He'll be unmistakable. It'll be so easy to identify. He's going to cause the lame to walk. He's going to cause the blind to see. He's going to raise the dead back to life. Yes. When John the Baptist put in prison and he was uh, wandering there and struggling there with... Uh, uh, the circumstances. He sent a crowd to Jesus. Is He the one or are we to expect another? Jesus didn't say, go back and tell Him. I said, yes. He said, go back and tell Him. The lame walk, the blind see, the dead are raised. Because that was by far the greatest evidence. Jesus would say time and again, look at the works of the Father that's being done in me and by me and glory, glorify the Father in it. When He said to His disciples that we're to be... Um, uh, lamps and we're to do good works. Why? That men might see it and glorify the Father. Not glorify us for the work, but see God's activity in us and glorify the Father through the life we live and the love we demonstrate. Well, he also now talks about the praise for the manger, but he talks about the power in the manger. That the government shall be on his shoulders. Isaiah saw it uh, prophesied. John saw it in fulfillment. This summer we preached through Revelation and we saw in Revelation chapter 11, John says, And the 24 elders who sat before God on their throne fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the One who is and was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. Now we look out today and we sometimes are confused by the wickedness of the world in which we live in. This old rogue, rebellious race runs rampant in sin, but there's coming a day when the Prince of Peace is going to tape it by the nap of the neck and reign and rule, and His righteousness will reign. Make no mistake. 
Make no mistake. I, I remember Dirk Hansen. I don't think I'll ever forget him. They, he and his wife were new Christians. They were a young couple, had a small child, and they were uh, part of the church that Nancy and I were members of early on when we'd come to Dallas for Bible college. And I was a Sunday school teacher, and we, it was a Christmas time, and we had taught on uh, the deity of Christ. And so he comes to me and he says, Tony, Tony, he said, when Jesus coming back, is he coming back again as a baby? I said, oh, no. Oh, no. Look here, and we turn back to Revelation chapter 19. Never again will it be humbled and humiliated. Never again will it be spit upon and cursed. Never again will they pull his beard and slap his face and mock him. He's coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the day we anticipate. That's the day we celebrate. But it began. It began. I can't quote it to the full, but it's been on my mind this week. A little bitty poem. It talks about the little babe in Bethlehem. His hands were humbly curled, but held within his dimple grips the hope of all the world. One day, those hands that are nail scarred are going to take hold of all that he's created, and he's going to rule and reign. The rogue world thinks today that they're somehow that their rebellion is triumphant, their rebellion is lasting. We can only say it the way the writer of Hebrews did when he said it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. They've spit upon, they've, re- they've rejected, they've rebelled against God over and again. But surely not us as people. Surely not us. When Jesus would say to us, if you love me, obey me. Yeah. That obedience is the greatest expression of love. It would not look at the world and its rebellion and be enticed to join it and to run rogue against our Redeemer and do great shame and disgrace to the Spirit of God who lives in us. Surely when we think about the ruling reign of Christ that's to come, the ruling reign of Christ in my heart and life today is one that's settled and one that's secure. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price, not with silver and gold as a corruptible thing, but the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. I'm His. He purchased me with sinless, holy blood to live for Him. Well, the character of the King is there in Isaiah's statement. He says, His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. You're not unfamiliar with those terms when we think about wonderful counselor we're reminded that he's unerring in his decisions he maketh no mistake oftentimes circumstances and situations come and we're troubled by them and we try to understand them we feel like if i can understand it somehow i can handle it better and some things will never make sense people sin against god and they sin against us But God makes no mistake there's nothing that comes into my life that does not pass through his providential purview We may have struggle reconciling that and understanding that, but we know that He is wonderful counselor. For the understanding, the wisdom that I need to live my life, the wisdom that I need to uh, uh, fulfill the responsibilities that are mine regardless of what yours are, we don't have it in ourselves. I know there's not a day when the sun rises that I've got sufficient wisdom for that day. I don't. But I know who does. And His Word says to me, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not. God's not playing hide and go seek with His wisdom. He's put it out before us and He said, Here it is. In the book of Proverbs, wisdom sounds like a woman walking through the streets asking, Who will love me? Who will, who will long for me? Who will, who will want me? Who will receive me into my, their life? Wisdom is not tucked away and hidden. God has put His wisdom on display And He says to us His children, find my wisdom and live. Simpleton, those of you who lack experience, find my wisdom and walk in it and overcome your lack of experience with my wisdom. When we read the words mighty God, we understand that He is unequal in His deity. He's mighty God. No matter what comes into my life, there's not any way that anyone can pervert or prevent God's purpose and will for my life 
Others may fail me. They may sin against me. They may have ill intention towards me. But nobody in earth, nobody under the earth can prevent God's purpose and will for my life. Why? Because He is mighty God. He is my mighty God. Nobody. Jesus said in order to rob from the strong man, you've got to first tie his hands. Why? Otherwise he'll box your ears. And he asked the question, who will bind the hand of God to steal you and rob you out of His hand? He's mighty God. His character is also expressed in the phrase, everlasting God. Unending of His days, He's Father eternally. There is a sad, temporary aspect to our lives and our relationships here. This has been a hard year for some of our families. They've had to say goodbye to the temporary relationship of loved ones, and it's always hard. But that's why Paul says to us as Christians, we sorrow, but not as those who have no hope. The loss of a loved one in these temporary living of these days causes sorrow, but we sink only so far where the, all of a sudden the foundation of the resurrection of those who've died in Christ Jesus stops our sinking, and we are buttressed up, and we are strengthened and built up, and we say we sorrow but not at the hopelessness. We know there is hope. We know that while they can't come back to us, we will one day go to them in Christ Jesus. He is everlasting Father, the Father of eternity. That relationship will never change. I think about how relationships change, even with passing of time, not even death, but just with the passing of time. There's always an altering and a changing in relationships. But how that relationship with God that began as my Father on the day when I bowed the knee of my heart and repented of my sin and made Jesus Lord and Savior of my life, that relationship of Him as my Father from that day through eternity will never alter or change. He will be and He is everlasting Father, the Father of eternity. And then in the phrase Prince of Peace, He's unparalleled in His designation, Prince of Peace. I, I, I would love to be able to somehow ask Mr. Gallup or somebody who's able to gather information and ask them, would you go into the, the wealthiest of the world, not just America, but the wealthiest of the world and find out how many of them with all of their wealth and all of the things that, all of the um, comforts that wealth can provide, find out how many of them have and live in on a day-to-day basis a genuine and real peace. And if not, would you ask them how much would they give of their possessions to have an eternal lasting peace? It's as though when you look at the most troubled on the planet, it's those who have the most. There's not peace there. Their lives are in constant disarray. In two chapters of the Old Testament in the book of Psalms 37, David says, I got confused. I got to looking at the wealthy. And from where I stood, it seemed like they had everything going for them. When they sinned, it didn't seem like they had troubles. They had trials. They had pro- it didn't look like it. He said, he said, I found myself almost like a beast. But something happened to change all that. That, that righted his perspective. He said, and then I went into the temple and I considered their end. And I realized. They have nothing I want if I have to give up anything God's given me to have it. But I would give up everything I have. What Paul said, isn't it? All things have become rubbish to me that I might gain Him. That I might know Him. That designate as the Prince of Peace. Now, we get caught up every now and then with the idea, we want world peace. All of the uh, uh, Miss America, I want world peace. All the pageants, I want world peace. Now remember, Jesus has a designate of what? Prince of Peace. But what did Jesus say? I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. What is He talking about? He's simply making the point that peace comes in a right relationship with me. If you don't receive me as Savior and Lord of my life, you will not only will you never know peace, you will know enmity with God, which is the greatest lack of peace and loss of peace there could ever be. He's come to be the Prince of Peace.
Well, and we're going to close looking at the crowning of the king. And it says, Of his kingdom and his peace, of his government and peace, there shall be no end. To be able to stand today in the kingdom of Christ. The Bible says that when we're saved, we're translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. And it is that kingdom that is going to go on. Now, the Jews were, were, were confused. They, uh, they didn't have to be, but they, like us, they went to the, the prophecies of God. Like we go to the cafeteria, I'll take some of this, I'll leave that, I'll take some of this, I'll leave that. And what they took was that how Christ was going to rule and reign. He was going to rule and reign. And man, they had the foot of Rome on their neck and they wanted somebody to come and take the, the governmental oppression off of them. And, 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 and when Christ came, and he, he says in Mark 1, the kingdom of God is here. If the king is there, the kingdom's there. And so they were confused. They, they thought when the moment Messiah shows up, all of this governmental um, stuff will end. There's things called uh, the present evil age and the kingdom of God. And they thought that when the kingdom of God came, the present evil age would stop and they would be buttressed together one to the other. What they didn't understand was the concept of the two kingdoms in the earth today that Christ came and His kingdom is here the present evil age is still here but because the king has come there is the kingdom of God and they are right now going along together this present evil age and the kingdom of God we're translated as I said earlier when Paul writes to Colossians we're translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of His dear Son we're called upon to live as kingdom people in this present evil age in the world but not of the world that's why in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was teaching them, there's kingdom life. You've heard it said, but I say unto you. And here's how my kingdom people are to live in the kingdom of God. We are now in the kingdom of God that will have no end. There's coming a day when the present evil age is going to stop. But the kingdom of God will continue on eternally. We're in that kingdom now. John saw it again in Revelation eleven fifteen. Then the seventh angel sounded, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever and ever. Sorry about that. He's come for that purpose, to rule and reign, and there'll be no end. Again, we wait on the rapture of the church and the beginning of the tribulation, that seven year period and at the end of which will be a thousand year reign of Christ when He will reign in Jerusalem on this earth and He'll fulfill every prophecy of the, king of the kingdom of David over Israel that's yet to be fulfilled. He'll fulfill every one of them. But even after that, then we step into what we refer to as eternity and His kingdom will continue on and He'll rule and reign forever. When we think about all of that, John has that sad statement in the opening words of his gospel when he talks about he's come in his tabernacle among us, he says he came to his own and his own did not receive him, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God to those that believe on his name. He came unto his own. He came unto his own. We don't spend a lot of time talking about that word and I'm not going to talk about it a whole lot other than just to say when he says he came into his own, he's not talking about just people that were like him, the human race. We are that. But it also carries the idea of the possessive. Somebody says, oh, whose truck is that? Oh, I own that. I own that. That means it's mine. I own that. He came into his own. How can we say it? He was creator. He owned it because he created it. And yet he still stepped in and purchased what he had already created unto himself and they looked at him they overlooked all the works that he did as Messiah and they still rejected him and then there's that glorious but that so often lifts our hopes in scripture but as many as received him to them See, people will know, well, well, why don't you just believe that everybody's going to go to heaven? Why don't you believe that everybody's going to be saved? Because Jesus didn't believe that. He didn't teach that. There is a qualifying. As many as received Him, to them He became the sons of God. They, they have the authority to become the sons of God. Why? Because our sin that separated us from Holy God was atoned and paid for. In Him, His righteousness is placed on us. And we are acceptable to the Father. And we, are, we have the authority, the right to become the children of God. 
those that believe in His name. Now this morning, can you imagine somebody looking at a gift, opening it, looking to the giver and saying, no, nah, I don't want this, take it back. <laughs> I doubt seriously that happened anywhere on the planet. But see, somehow people uh, don't see re not receiving Christ, they don't see it as rejecting Him. I'm just leaving Him alone. He didn't come for you to leave Him alone. He came for you to receive Him. And not to receive Him is to reject Him. There, is, there can be no neutrality towards Christ. It's either, He said, if you're not for me, you're against me. If you're not gathering in, you're scattering abroad. There can be no neutrality. When He asked in Matthew, who do men say that the Son of Man is? It is a dividing line of all mankind. Either He is to us, the Savior, the Son of God, or He's not. But there is no neutrality. To fail to receive Christ is to reject Him. But today all who have received Him have the authority to become the sons of God. There is by, in some religious teachings a thing called the sin of presumption. Are you going to heaven? Yes, I am. How do you, oh, you're sin. That's a presumption. No, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to heaven because Jesus said, if I received Him as Savior and Lord of my life, that's His promise. I'm not going on any merit of my own, but I'm going on His because He was the child born, the son given, to save us from our sin. Now this morning as we get ready to close, we always want to give an invitation. Maybe there's one here this morning that for a time in a way like you've never understood before, the Holy Spirit has helped you understand a need that you didn't even realize you had. And in an understanding of that, you realize that only Christ can offer, only Christ can do what you need. And that's that you need a Savior to forgive of your sin. If that's not you this morning, if you can truthfully say, Oh, Brother Tony, I, I've accepted Christ as Savior and Lord of my life. Then in these next moments, as we have an invitation for response, would your response be the deepest of worship, the greatest of gratitude for the condescension, the humility of a Savior who would do that for you and for me to save us from our sin? Will you bow with me? And we're going to have a word of prayer. And after that, we're going to extend our invitation and we'll be done.